numbered the events of salvation. If we said, okay, this is how it works, and, and we're going to put it in a list. Last week's doctrine of election would happen first. All right, so if we were going to list it all out uh, on the board, uh, we would put election uh, first, that doctrine of election. Then you'd arrive at where we are today. So this would be number two if you were to put the steps of salvation in order. Without the gospel invitation, and this is on your notes, or gospel call, no one would be saved. Right, so there's this gospel invitation, that's this call, and, and, and Ganson's saying, I remember when I was a boy and I watched Billy Graham and he would give an invitation and it, it, it pricked my heart. So without that kind of gospel call, no one is to be saved. Romans 10, 14, um, I think I left that on there for you. Let me get it here. Yes, how can men believe in the one of whom they have not heard? Paul tells the Thessalonians, that God called them to salvation through the gospel. That's in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. However, what we're going to look at today is the fact that the gospel call is one calling with two different aspects. All right, so you see there the big heading, effective calling. And I purposefully left up there Romans chapter 8, verse 30. And those whom he predestined, all right, different word, but but talking about that election piece that God chooses us. He has to choose us because in our sin nature, in our bent, our rebellious, hell-bent nature that we came out of the womb with, there's no way we would look to God. No absolute way that we in that hell-bent state would say, oh God, I, I adore you without him drawing us to himself. Right? It makes sense if we were created for God's glory. If you believe the Westminster Confession, the Catechism, question number one, uh, you know, what is uh, the purpose of man or the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and what? Enjoy him forever. Glorify God and enjoy him forever. It glorifies God when God is the one who initiated our salvation. Because if it were us, then it would be about us. Oh, I chose God. I chose, you know, yeah, I was hell bent. I was going this way, but I, look at me. I am so good. I'm so much better than my neighbor. I don't cut the grass on Sunday. And I'm choosing God. Oh, oh, out of the back here. That's not how it is. God chose us. It had to be God who set his affection on us. And so you see um, that verse. Sorry, I, I went down that path. Those who be predestined, he also called. Y'all have to remember, I haven't been live in two weeks, so I might go a little bit longer than normal. Um, I'll try not to, though. I, am, I see what time it is. Those whom he called, look what he did. This is Paul writing this. Those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. All right, so the calling Paul refers to in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, is not the type of calling that people sometimes say, I was called to that church, or I was called to this job, or I was called to be a member of that church. That's not what we're talking about. This calling is related to those who were predestined, those whom God had set his affection upon, who then became justified. That is, it's a calling that came specifically to those who were believers in Jesus. Now, when God calls people in this kind of powerful way, he calls them, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says he calls them into the fellowship of his son. Oh yeah, you have it on your notes, good. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. And in 1 Thessalonians 2, 12, he calls us into his own kingdom and glory. They now belong to Christ. They're called to be saints. They're now, we, those of us who are in this position, have now an understanding of true peace and freedom and hope and holiness and patient endurance of suffering, and we have eternal life to come. That's something to be excited about. So this kind of calling, this is on your notes, uh, this kind of calling is a summons from the king of the universe. So this effective calling is that calling about it's a summons. The king of the universe summons us, and it's a summons that can't be denied. 
and it brings about the desired response in people's hearts. So God setting his affection on Chris Mitchell means that in that, that, that I have to respond, all right, it's because I'm not a robot. I, I, I'm not just pre-programmed. There had to be a response to this effective calling, but, but God is summoning me, and his summons will bring about the desired response in people's hearts. Now, it's an internal call. Did I leave that on there? No. It's an internal call given by our sovereign God who summons people to himself in such a way that they always respond in saving faith through the work of the Holy Spirit. So when God sets his affection on someone and, and, and sets them apart and, and calls them, they will always respond in saving faith because God set his affection, he's called them. Because it, now here's, this is only blank, because it comes from God and always results in saving faith, it's sometimes referred to as effective calling. Effective calling. And I left the uh, definition there. Effective calling defined as an act of God the Father speaking through the human, don't miss that, speaking through the human proclamation of the gospel, which is why we go to the ends of the earth to take the message of the gospel. You say, why does uh, a good chunk of my dollar that I give to Eastview go to the IMB? Because we want the ends of the earth to hear the human proclamation of the gospel. So in which, that effective calling, in which he summons people to himself in such a way that they respond in saving faith. Why he worked it out this way, I don't know. I believe by faith that God works this way, though. All right, so Romans 8, 29 says that those whom God predestined, he also called. As we can see, this calling is an effective calling. It's an act of God that guarantees a response because as Paul goes on to say, those who are called are also justified and glorified. We are to call them, this is on your notes, we are to call everyone then to repent of their sins and to trust in Christ. So it would be easy, what we call hyper-Calvinists, Hyper-Calvinists would say, well, since God knows who he's going to set his affection on, and since he's going to save who he's going to save, and since they're going to respond because they are chosen by him, we don't have to do any evangelism. I have to, the, it's tacky, but the frozen chosen kind of mindset that's given to some people um, because of their belief in, in some of this, um, that's not what we would say as people uh, who follow Christ, we wouldn't name call anyway but you might have heard that term so I want you to understand where it comes from it's that idea that they're they're elect and they don't have to you know they can just rest for the rest of their lives um, and not, not have to do anything else not have to go tell the world the, the hope of Jesus Christ because God's going to save who he's going to save and they don't have to have a part of it um, we believe that you do have to call everyone to repent of their sins and trust in Christ but, and I put this on here, we're also aware that not everyone will respond to the gospel. We are not universalists. Everyone is not going to heaven. To say such a thing denies the truth of the Bible. The Bible says that's not the case. There will be those who will go to eternal destruction where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Only God can effectually call us to himself, John 6, 44, Jesus says, no one can come to me. And we addressed this when we were walking through John back at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Then you get to verse 65 of the same chapter. He repeats it. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. So those of us who are Christians have been called to be such. We've been given ears to hear and eyes to see the light of the gospel. And that should cause us to rejoice. We're only believers because God set his affection on us and called us to be a believer. It was not us. If it was, then that would be works. Works won't save. And so God gets all the glory then. If it's all about him, then he gets all the glory. We know we've been chosen and called by God if we believe God. This is on your notes. Repented of our sins. And again, trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, I 
put that in here a few times, this whole idea of repentance and trusting. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.10, this is what Peter means when he tells God's elect to be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. How do you do that? How do you make sure? Do you want to know that you know that you know? You sometimes hear preachers say that, or Bible preachers will say that a lot. You want to know that you know that you know? Well, how do you do that? It's on your notes. We do this by examining our lives and seeing if they reflect the biblical teaching of a faithful response to the gospel. You want to know if you've been saved? Have you repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Then you are one of the called. You are one of the ones that he has set his affection on. Now, does God, John 3, 16, we can run back there. God so loves the world. Yes, he does. He does so love the world. So how are there some that then go to hell? It's by his perfect design. I don't know how it works. I don't know how he decides. I would be presumptuous to even begin to say how God does that. Why is my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, more than likely in hell right now? He joked about it. I've told you that many times. How he joked about hell. Going down and working with the devil. Why was he like that? Why is he there? My, my God loved him. My God loved my grandfather. My grandfather rejected the truth, made it into a game, a joke. And he's, he knows now there's a God. We examine our lives then, friends. Examine our lives and we keep to desiring to be equipped to be disciple to disciple others, who disciple others, who run tell this gospel message. Because we don't know who's been effectually called. We don't know who God has set his affection on. And so we run tell everyone and leave the results up to God. That's really the easy way to say it. We'll go tell the gospel message. We'll make him known across the land. Leave the results to God. We don't have to be concerned about that. Not everybody's going to believe. Well, there's a general calling. It's a broader sense of calling. It refers to any preaching of the gospel to anyone, whether they respond or not. So in distinction from effective calling, that always brings a response. The gospel call in general, which goes forth to all people, is sometimes referred to as the general calling. That's what goes in that blank. General call. The gospel call, or this general call, goes forth through the human preaching of the gospel. Paul makes this clear, 2 Thessalonians 2.14. He writes to believers that their calling from God came through our gospel. That is the gospel that Paul and others preached to them. You say, well, I'm not a preacher, so this, this marks me out. I don't have to worry about that. No, I'm sorry. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> We're all proclaimers. We're all to be those who make the gospel known throughout the world. That is why, let me see if I put it on here. No. But that is why it's important that we boldly proclaim the gospel message. Trusting God will, through his effective call, do what he did with Lydia in Acts 16, 14, where it says the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So as we go out and offer a general call to the, to the nations, we don't know whether God's been doing the effectual, effectual call on their heart. We don't know that. But we don't have to be concerned about that. We're concerned about a God who's made himself known to us in this word. He's revealed himself to us. He said, I, you, can know, you can know me. You can come back to me. You can live with me forever. We go and proclaim that gospel message and let God do the work of the effectual call. And because when the effectual call comes, they will always respond in faith because it's the call from God. So that's why it's important that we boldly proclaim the gospel message. Now, not all gospel calls are effective. The job of believers is to explain the gospel message. It's God's job to make that message or call effective. So what are some elements? I didn't leave you any blanks, so you don't have to worry there. Uh, elements of the gospel call, three basic elements that should be part of every gospel call. Every time we take an opportunity to share the gospel, number one, we should explain the facts concerning salvation. Well, what are those facts? Well, I gave you three, so 
All people have sinned. If you're going to be proclaiming this gospel message, this general calling that we're all called to do, we do have to give an understanding of the facts about salvation, that all of us have sinned, that the penalty for sin is death, and that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. All right, that we, we need to make that clear. Saying, oh, I invited somebody to church last week, and so I shared the gospel. No. All right, it's great that you invited them to church. But inviting them to church is not sharing the gospel. Number two. Oh, well, I said under, sorry, under that three. We're, but simply stating those facts, you just went up to somebody and stated those facts, that's not enough. There needs to be an invitation to repent and believe this good news personally. So that's the second element of a gospel call there. You see that number two. There must be an invitation to respond to Christ personally in repentance and faith. So you're sharing the gospel, you're, you're sharing your story. You invite somebody out for lunch. You have your neighbor over for tea or coffee. You ask a coworker to go lunch with you. You, you a family member, hey, sit down with me, let's talk. You present to them the fact that all people have sinned, that their penalty for sin is death, that Christ is the only way. Then to you have to invite them to respond to that information by faith personally. And then number three, there's a promise of forgiveness and eternal life. So those are the elements of the gospel call. To those who respond in faith to the gospel call, look, God promises their sins will be forgiven. They'll experience eternal life with God himself. John 6, 37, Jesus himself said, whoever comes to me, I'll never cast out. We present, we preach, all of us, we preach this gospel call, this, this gospel message, we we'll give an invitation. God has to bring about a change in that individual's heart before he or she is able to respond in faith. It's not that person. It's not, oh, wow, I heard uh, my parents, me personally. I heard my parents share the gospel with me. I heard Pastor Ryan Eklund in Greenwood, South Carolina, share the gospel with me. And so uh, that's enough. That's all I have to do. Well, no, God then brings that change in the individual's heart, which makes me able to respond in faith. That change you see there is often referred to as regeneration. Regeneration is completely an act of God. No role of ours whatsoever. We don't do any regeneration. This question here. The answer to this, that discussion, really helps you understand whether you whether you get the idea of regeneration because it says do you know when man is considered to be regenerated is he regenerated before he hears the gospel or after it and so the answer is we know from scripture that regeneration comes before we can respond to the gospel with saving faith so the gospel call goes out then God does the regeneration in our heart you know, he does the, the tweaking of our hearts, then we can respond in faith. So, so if anybody ever asks you, does regeneration come before or after faith? Your answer is before. God has to do that work of, of, of preparing your heart. And I'll give you an example. I don't know if I put it on here. We'll get down there. Sorry, I'm getting ahead. Yet it's difficult to determine the exact moment in time that a person hears the proclamation of the gospel and is regenerated. So don't worry if you don't know that time. Because, it, I mean, it happens probably like, I mean, instantaneously. For some, you've heard the gospel message and you respond right then in faith and believe. Well, that means that some time between the moment that speaker got finished preaching the gospel and inviting you to respond, God did the regeneration and you responded about faith. All right, I mean, it happens that quickly. For most, you know, that, that, that's how God does it. So if you can't say, oh, pastor, maybe I'm not saved. I don't know when I was regenerated. That, that, you don't have to be concerned with that. God does that work anyway. We know that the preaching of the gospel generally coincides with man becoming regenerated. At least that's what happened to the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Peter was still speaking the gospel. He was still sharing it with them, and the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. So regeneration is an instantaneous event. 
That's what I left out of that blank. It's an instantaneous event in which the Holy Spirit works in us and enables us to have faith to follow Christ. Friends, I've said this before. It is ridiculous that we believe that somebody walked on water, was born of a virgin, died on the cross, rose on the third day, ascended into heaven, and is now seated at the right hand of God. That is, from a worldly perspective, from the mind of humanity, that is ridiculous. We're all out of our mind. We're wasting our time here. This whole building is a waste. They could have a mall here at 1430 Gordon Road. We're just deranged lunatics. Faith is a gift. It takes faith to believe that a God we haven't seen with our physical eyes would, would I won't list them all again for sake of time. Do all that stuff. And us actually believing in our heart. That takes faith. Because with a worldly mindset, we're just out of our minds. We need help. We need to be admitted to, I don't know what it's called here in Mali, it's called Dorothea Dix. That's where I grew up in that area. That was the hospital where you needed some you know, help with your mind. That's what the world would say. That's where we should all be admitted to. But by faith, we believe those things to be true about God. And it took God to do that in us. That's all this is talking about. If you, if you live here just knowing that, you will have captured the heart of this. Then after that work of the Holy Spirit, it gives us the faith to follow Christ. It's followed by our justification. That's a legal term. We'll talk about that next week, our justification and adoption. So we looked at election. Now we're talking about the effect of calling, general calling. Next week, we'll look at justification and adoption. Regeneration is one of those events of, in salvation that are, is all up to God. Man is completely passive in his own regeneration. He cannot give himself physical life, nor can he give himself spiritual life. It would be like a body in the morgue trying to give itself CPR. It just doesn't work. Regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the blank I left out there. And when people talk about being born again, what they're actually saying is that they've been regenerated because that's what it means. Regeneration is another way to say, I've been born again. I'm not who I was. I have a, I'm a new creation. Second uh, Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Ezekiel 36, we won't, we'll just skip over this. Take, it, take time to look. Regeneration of the Old Testament, you can see it in Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. You'll see that it's God who's acting. He, God over and over says, I will do these things. I'll give you a new heart. I'll remove your heart of stone. Then you see regeneration in the New Testament. Look this up later, John 1, 13. Christians are born not of natural descent, but, but born of the will of God. It's God who must take that first step in order to give us the ability to repent and believe. This is very important for us to understand. We need to be regenerated first before we can produce saving faith. Many well-meaning Christians say that if you believe in Christ as your Savior, then you'll be born again after you believe. But the scripture does not say this. For example, in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, Luke says of Lydia, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So did you see the order? First, God opened her heart. Then she could respond in faith. Now, it may be for that fraction of a second, but regeneration does come before faith. We cannot have a soft heart and ears to hear until God gives us them. That goes in your blank. God gives us them. Think of it like this. Before your heart can make a decision, it first has to have a pulse. So regeneration is that spiritual defibrillator that happens to make the heart beat before it can do anything, like believing in God. Regeneration, this is on your uh, sheet, always produces fruit in the Christian life. And true regeneration will be followed by a changed life. Those of us who have been truly regenerated, it will come out of us. Fruit will happen. 
by God's design in us. So election, gospel call, regeneration, all the way up to our future glorification, it's all just one package deal. God cannot fail in our salvation. Our redemption is authored and completed by him and held together by him and guaranteed by a seal of the Holy Spirit by him. Regeneration creates in us a state of heart. This is on your, on your guide and spirit causes us to turn from our sin and commit ourselves to Christ in faith. 1 John 3 now I know one who is born of God will continue to sin. But God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. Now wait a minute, you might say. I, I sin. I still sin. What's he talking about here? He cannot go on sinning. He's been born of God. He cannot go on sinning in such a way that he rejects the gospel call. We're still going to sin. We're still going to struggle with sin. It's a fight to the end. I put to death the deeds of the body. Well, how is the call responded to? We'll finish with this. Once God is summoned through an effective call, once he's done that work of regeneration in our heart, the necessary response then is repentance and faith. Repentance goes there. You see uh, that next part. Simply knowing and affirming the facts of salvation as stated above in the gospel call is not enough. True saving faith, while it includes knowledge, okay, that's knowing the facts of salvation. We said that. That's true. True saving faith does not have knowledge. It does include approval. In other words, I agree those facts are true. It also requires trust. That's that first blank on page four. It also requires trust. Therefore, one who has true saving faith has moved from investigating, that's what goes there, has moved from investigating Jesus' claims, because that's what any unbeliever's doing when we present the claims of Jesus to them. They have to, you know, they're investigating. Is this true? So that person who's got now true saving faith has moved from investigating Jesus' claims to believing those claims are true, Believing goes there. And from believing that the claims are true, then we have to trust in Jesus for forgiveness of sins and eternal life with God. If I have true saving faith, I no longer simply believe facts about Jesus. Instead, I personally trust Jesus to save me. There's a difference. A lot of people believe in facts about Jesus. Good teacher, kind man, did some good work on earth. That's fine. That's not going to get you to heaven. We've got to move from the, knowing the facts about who Jesus is to personally believing what he's done for us. Now the Bible uses strong language to describe this personal trust. We don't just have to believe Jesus. In other words, believe that what he says is truthful, but we have to believe in him. We have to put personal trust in him, depend on him. Repentance is not merely, this is on your notes, repentance is not merely feeling sorry for your sins or even recognizing that they're bad. That's not what repentance is, just, only. It's not just feeling sorry, recognizing they're bad. It is, and I put this on there, it is seeing sin as God sees it and turning away from it and toward him. In Kittel's Theological Dictionary of New Testament words, he says, Repentance involves a definitive turning from evil and a resolute turning to God in total obedience. So I gave us then to end what true repentance involves. Number one, it involves the intellect. It involves our mind. In our minds, we have to start thinking differently about sin. We start to think differently about ourselves. We start to think differently about others. We start to think differently about God. So you see on there, it must involve recognition of sin, also of who God is and of God's way of solving our sin problems. So true repentance works in the mind. It has to be a mind thing. 
True repentance also involves the emotions. It's going to involve some remorse, some regret. It is right as believers to feel broken when we've sinned. It's a right feeling because repentance involves our mind and our emotions. Number three, it involves the will. True repentance involves the will. It is a choice to turn from making choices based upon what I might think to making choices that are based on the Word of God. That's a choice I have to make with my will. And so true repentance says, I'm going to turn away from the ways of the world and I'm going to follow the ways of God's Word. Number four, true repentance involves a person's desires. In other words, our life won't be governed by a love for the world, a lust of the flesh, but our life will be governed by the things that please the God of the universe. And finally, true repentance, number five, involves a person's behavior, actions, and speech. What he does and what he doesn't do, how one lives. And so repentance and faith are really two sides of the same coin. For when I genuinely renounce and forsake my sin, I then turn to faith in Christ, trusting in him alone for my salvation. And that initial repentance and faith provides a pattern for ongoing heart attitudes of repentance and faith that continue for the rest of a Christian's life. It's not repent, repent and believe and I'm done. I check that off. I can just go on and live my life how I want and thank God my name's written in the book of the Lamb's book of life and I'm good. That's not the Christian message. Christian message is I'm going to repent and believe by faith a pattern that involves the intellect, the emotions, the will, the desires, and behavior that continues to conform my life to that of Christ. As Paul writes in Colossians 2, 6, I put that on there, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. I want to pray for us. We'll end the recording. And then if you have any questions or comments or thoughts, we'll do that. And then we'll be dismissed. Father, I thank you for your effectual calling in our lives. I thank you for the responsibility that every one of us in here who have been called by you, we have a responsibility then to go and make the gospel call, that general calling known to the world. Telling people about their sin, showing them that there is a an answer to that sin. Sharing with them the hope of Jesus Christ. Offering them to believe by repentance and faith. May we, Father, not grow weary in doing good to those around us who are far from you. Thank you for calling us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. May we be spotlights of that kind of light to the world around us. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen.